Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Barbara Moskowitz, and it's really nice to see you. I'm honored to know most of you or many of you present in addition to Nori Mazone, our um, is Judy Willett, our senior program manager, our director, Susan Rowlett, and on vacation, on well-deserved vacation, is our colleague, Chris White. Um, as many of you know, and uh, the Dementia Caregiver Support Program of the Dementia Care Collaborative started in 2017, and we're so proud of what we've been able to accomplish so far. Uh, our, our, our uh, mission is to transform memory care and to create a learning and supportive environment for you, for your family, for patients and our, our colleagues. We do that by offering programs such as this, health and resiliency programs, which you may be receiving notices for. We offer care consultations to individuals who are seen in specific clinics support groups and skills classes, and much on the horizon. It's a very exciting time for all of us, and our team is eager to uh, get to know you and work with you. Our program is entirely funded through philanthropy, and if you're interested in knowing how you can support our program, please feel free to reach out to Nori, Judy, Susan, or me, and we'll be happy to give you some further information. And now it's my tremendous pleasure to introduce Dr. Jennifer Gatchel. I'm pleased to tell you that I've heard Dr. Gatchel speak on a few occasions, and every time she speaks, I learn something new and something more important. Uh, she's just fabulous, and I'm eager that she's here for all of you tonight. Dr. Gatchel is a geriatric psychiatrist and a physician psychiatrist at Mass General, and she's an assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. She's established a clinical research niche investigating the interface of mood and cognition in aging and Alzheimer's disease. Her body of work has been recognized by the National Institutes of Health, the Bright Focus Foundation, the Alzheimer's Association, and the American Psychiatric Association. In addition to all that brilliance, Jennifer's innovative research program is complemented by her leadership roles, advocating for patients with dementia, promoting healthy brain aging, and training the next generation of geriatric psychiatrists. So you can see and hear why we are, well, you will see, and you can hear why we are so honored to have Dr. Getchell. Her topic tonight is understanding mood and behavioral symptoms related to dementia. Welcome, Dr. Gatchel, and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Barbara, for that really kind introduction. And thanks so much to um, Susan, Nori, Judy, and the Dementia Care Collaborative for um, inviting me to speak at uh, this event. I'm really honored to be here and to be here virtually with all of you. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I'm gonna share my screen um, here. <clears throat> so as Barbara mentioned, what I'll be talking about tonight um, is taking a deep dive into understanding mood and behavioral symptoms related to dementia syndromes. And um, I hope that we'll have plenty of time um, at the end to go over any questions that you may have coming into the talk or, or on topics that I'll touch upon as we go through the slides. And uh, as Nori said, feel free to um, drop those in the chat um, as they come up. These are my disclosures. So uh, this topic is one that is very near and dear to me, uh, not only on a, prof on a professional level as a geriatric psychiatrist, um, but also has um, a tremendous personal value to me in kind of shaping my uh, life journey and my professional journey in this field. So um, believe it or not, this is actually me when I was a teenager and next to my grandmother Rose um, in Texas where I grew up. And uh, my nana Rose was an immigrant from Italy 
And she was very uh, kind of near and dear to me growing up as one of my primary caregivers. And around the time this picture was taken, it's actually a transformative time for her and my family. Um, when she began, um, again, this she had a very uh, vivacious personality, was you know, always going around making homemade uh, Italian food and, and pastries. And then around the time this picture was taken, our family started to notice um, some changes in her uh, movement, um, in her, uh, um, just how fluid she was with her movements to the point that she would start tripping. Eventually she developed swallowing difficulties. This was a very frightening time for her and my, and my family given this somewhat rapid change and dramatic change for her. And eventually she was diagnosed. We got connected with a behavioral neurologist um, in our area. And I remember you know, going to these initial visits and we were all terrified and him really holding my grandmother's hands and providing comfort to her and really helping to calm her down just through his presence. Well, he also provided us with a very informant, you know, was very helpful in terms of diagnosing her with Parkinson's disease and eventually Parkinson's disease dementia. And through her journey with Parkinson's disease dementia, um, she developed um, not only these initial motor disturbances and movement, uh, which were, you know, some, in some ways helped by, uh, you know, medications, but also some profound um, changes in personality related to her mood and anxiety. So some very severe anxiety symptoms and eventually changes in her memory and thinking that progressed. And although the treatments were able to somewhat you know, uh, um, kind of uh, slow the progression of these symptoms. Um, um, I kind of learned from this experience that we don't, we fundamentally don't have cures for these devastating diseases and even less so for behavioral symptoms that may arise during them. So again, this topic is a very near and dear place in my heart. It really inspired me on my life's path. We're in Texas where I grew up. Um, I went on to pursue an MD and also did a PhD in science investigating molecular uh, mechanisms of neurodegeneration and mouse models. So really trying to take a deep dive into what is going on in the brain when we have certain disease proteins that can cause Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease that give rise um, to these behaviors that we see not only in movement, but also sometimes in um, just agitation, anxiety, aggression. And, um, and so I did, you know, spent my time, spent a lot of time in Texas training to do this, and then took a move up to north, up north to Massachusetts, uh, where I completed clinical training in this area, and really, um, at this point, kind of honed in on focusing on uh, geriatric psychiatry and really again focusing on the set of symptoms that are closely related to cognitive changes and dementia syndromes, behavioral um, symptoms, and. Um, through this transition, um, not only from kind of allegiances to sports teams and different cuisine that we might find in Texas versus New England, and I also had a broader shift in, um, in uh, my research interests from studying kind of very basic molecular processes in cells and in mouse models to, to encountering many you know, patients and their families through my training and my work as a geriatric psychiatrist. Um, so kind of seeing real world manifestations um, of dementia syndromes from very early stages to late stages in their progression and how we can, you know, how we think about uh, memory changes and behavioral changes. And so currently I have been a research program investigating these changes through a series of clinical observations and characterizations um, of patients and their care partners, and also implementing ways that we can probe mechanisms using uh, different forms of brain imaging and different uh, probes of, of, of mechanism, even through uh, to, through blood and other, other biomarkers. So I'll talk a little bit about these things uh, tonight. Um, so what I wanted to touch upon, and of course, um, you know, any one of these topics could be a top, could be a, a session in itself, but I wanted to just provide an overview of what are behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. They're also referred to as neuropsychiatric symptoms or NPS. So you may have encountered um, you know, them described in either of these ways. And then I also wanted to touch upon just an overview of principles of managing these symptoms. How can we think about managing these not only you know, as a clinician, either as a specialist, as a PCP, the, as a um, social worker, as a therapist, and as a family member? How do we think about, um, as a care partner, how do we think about principles of managing these symptoms? And then um, where are we going as a field? So with research in this area, kind of what is the focus and what might lie ahead 
uh, for um, for for uh, better you know management of these symptoms and prevention of dementia, which is our ultimate goal, of course. And again, you know, can we prevent Alzheimer's disease and related dementias? And that is a public health priority. Um, you know, it's a you know, I don't, goes without saying for everyone on the call, the huge, tremendous public health burden of um, Alzheimer's disease alone, in addition to other dementia, common dementia syndromes, um, and that uh, over six, almost six, six million Americans in the U.S. alone will um, will be affected by 2050 without development of better preventions or treatments. And this uh, is in addition to over up to 16 million. Um, individuals who provide care for someone with Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. So it's a tremendous um, public and personal health uh, priority. So I mentioned in that slide, you know, Alzheimer's disease is one type of dementia. I know there've been other talks in this um, session about, um, you know, you know, making the diagnosis of dementia. What does that entail? What are the different, what may be the different types of dementias that are encountered or that you or um, a loved one may be ex facing? And so we think about dementia as a clinical syndrome where there is loss of memory or other cognitive abilities um, due to changes in the brain and that these changes are severe enough that they have interfere with independence and daily living and independent functioning. And so this is an umbrella kind of clinical term um, in terms of meeting these clinical criteria. Uh, but there can be many etiologies or types of dementia with Alzheimer's disease, again, being the, the leading type and vascular versus Lewy bodies versus frontal temporal dementia, Parkinson's disease dementia, as I mentioned, that my grandmother was affected with, and many mixed cases of mixed pathology, and really the subtype being defined by the molecular types of molecular changes, the brain-based changes that are giving rise to the dementia syndrome, the clinical syndrome. So Alzheimer's disease um, is a type of dementia that is kind of on the pathological level, it's defined by um, key features of amyloid, uh, protein, and tau, um, intraneuronal uh, neurofibrillary tangles as shown in this autopsy picture on the right. So Alzheimer's disease clinically, it's characterized what we see in patients um, and in loved ones are difficult to remembering newly learned information as one of the most common um, early presentations, um, so really rapid forgetting. So uh, remote memories may be intact, but new memories, uh, it's hard, they're, they're more difficult to form those new memories. So you may hear kind of questions repeated, um, anecdotes repeated, and the individual just does not, uh, not, not encoding those new, those new, that new information. Other symptoms that can arise include disorientation, confusion, progressing to more serious memory loss, and also importantly, uh, changes in mood and behavior. And thinking back actually to the first, you know, the patient that was described by Dr. Alzheimer, Auguste, um, in describing Alzheimer's disease, actually presented, uh, was characterized by um, having very profound personality changes and delusions. And so, um, Although we you know, often think about dementia syndromes um, and maybe some of the more common ways that we may recognize them or present them or, or, or that they may come into presentation is through um, noticing either in a loved one or you know, someone noticing themselves a change in memory thinking, there can also be changes in personality that can range from subtle to not so subtle and that these can accompany um, early stages and late stages of Alzheimer's disease and dementia syndromes. So what are uh, the categories in which we might think about some of these changes occurring? So these uh, behavioral um, and psychological symptoms or neuropsychiatric symptoms, MPS, these occur across a variety of domains, uh, ranging from mood and motivation, um, including uh, depression, dysphoria, which I'll focus on a little bit later in the talk and is a focus of my own research, um, anxiety, apathy, irritability, elation, euphoria, all of which may be uh, long-standing, uh, you know, uh, um, characteristics or, or traits of an individual or maybe newer onset and kind of related to the dementia syndrome. They can also um, span uh, and include disturbances of thought and, and activity as well as disturbances of uh, sleep and appetite. And importantly, again, um, the constellation of uh, symptoms that may occur can vary from one subtype of dementia to another, and it can also vary in terms of whether 
these symptoms might occur more typically early on or even in preclinical stages of a dementia syndrome, as opposed to at moderate or late stages as, as the dementia progresses. So again, in just providing uh, an overview of these symptoms, they are incredibly common or incredibly prevalent. Uh, so prevalence of 60 to 80%, lifetime risk of nearly 100%. Um, they're characterized by fluctuations, um, but usually they will occur in some, in some form across one or several of these domains um, in most uh, patients through the span of a dementia syndrome. Um, this can look very, again, look very differently depending on the individual and depending on the subtype of dementia. And when they occur, importantly, they are associated with significant morbidity and more rapid functional decline. And often in more cases than not, a decreased quality of life for the, for the um, for the individual, the care partner, and the family. And so what do we know about you know, these, uh, these symptoms and how they might arise? So really uh, the precise mechanisms um, is, is for the most part like an area of active research right now. And mechanisms uh, are, are largely unclear, undefined at this time. Um, but some mechanisms that have been proposed for these symptoms are those that might be related to central pathways in dementia. So for example, Alzheimer's disease, we know that amyloid, tau, other types of neurodegeneration are really integral to defining how that disease progresses and takes shape in the brain. So in some instances, um, it's been hypothesized that uh, these proteins, these processes may also give rise to behavioral changes as well as other mechanisms have been proposed such as inflammation or changes in um, kind of the body's stress response as possibly giving rise um, to some of these behavioral symptoms. Now in large part, because there is an unclear and incomplete understanding of the biology of these symptoms or their brain related basis, um, we, we currently have, there is a lack of, uh, of pharmacology of medications um, that can target and effectively prevent or treat these symptoms. And so in general, there are really no medications that are specifically FDA approved for this set of symptoms in Alzheimer's disease. Um, now there are a few, there are some uh, specific exceptions such as uh, Nudexta in the treatment of pseudobulbar affect, which is a specific type of behavioral change, um, inappropriate um, um, laughter and crying that can, that can occur in some uh, cognitive syndromes, as well as new plas that are PIM advanced or in for psychosis and Parkinson's disease. Other than these two medications, generally other medications that may be used um, sometimes commonly for the management or the treatment of these symptoms are generally going to be would be used off in an off label manner. Now as well, the, the uh, prevention and the treatment of these symptoms is further complicated because um, there is, you know, uh, we, we, there is mounting evidence of, of brain-based or biological pathways that may be affected to give rise to these symptoms. But there's also, as we all know, in the call, there's also an interaction with environment. So there's kind of biology interacting with environment. So um, many causes, uh, many, many um, triggers or stimuli in the environment um, can also kind of serve as triggers uh, for these behaviors and which can include difficulty with tasks, um, being kind of an unfamiliar or strange or foreign environment, loud noises or a frantic environment, um, experiences of physical discomfort, um, difficulty commu with communicating. So this is really true for even anyone without a dementia syndrome. If we are having these experiences in our environment, they can really give rise to our sense of distress and well being. And this kind of interacting with changes in brain biology um, can together give rise with, um, can kind of interact in a synergistic way um, to give rise to these symptoms and, and also to kind of shape how they might progress. And I just wanted to share um, uh, some, a few anecdotes um, that um, are included in a podcast. I don't know if anyone's um, uh, been familiar with Bob's Last Marathon podcast, uh, which is a really, I highly recommend it. And um, Judith Johansson, who if you haven't met her, is an amazing uh, speaker, advocate uh, uh, for patients with dementia. Um, she was the caregiver for her husband, Steve, who was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's disease. And so, and she accompanied him throughout his journey with um, dementia and has shared and, and shares her anecdotes and her experiences 
um, in this process and through many uh, for, uh, forums, including through this podcast. And she's also the, uh, the coordinator in our, in our ADRC here at, um, in, at MGH. When I'm asked about our dementia journey, people's well-meaning questions seem to be, did he forget you? Or did he ever get aggressive and hit you? These are not simple questions and they certainly don't have simple answers, but they're on everyone's mind. My answer to the first question is the heart never forgets. So although he might have, uh, the name may have escaped him this time, his heart never forgot me and we were always connected. And my answer to the second question is a little more complicated. And in this uh, particular uh, episode of the podcast, Understanding Agitation, and it's about a 13 minute um, session, I, I think that um, Judy uh, really in this session uh, encapsulates um, so much about uh, recognizing these symptoms and, and think about how to manage them and where there are gaps in, uh, in how we manage them um, that, uh, that, I, that, I can, that I can do justice to in this, in this talk today. But that's why I wanted to kind of highlight that and encourage anyone who wanted you know, to, to, to go and listen to that in its full uh, format. Um, and, and, and to think about um, just principles of management. So um, it's, you know, it's complicated and these symptoms are common, they are prevalent. Again, they will, they will come up in some form, uh, almost everyone's journey with dementia. And so the goals of management are several. And so the first being, um, if we think about these symptoms kind of one, like, a, like a pain syndrome, like once the pain begins, it's really, it can be, uh, take more aggressive approaches. It can be more challenging to get the pain or kind of the fire put out. So we want to try to prevent these symptoms from emerging at the earliest stages as possible. Um, we want to identify what are the target symptoms or behaviors that we're um, observing, how can we alleviate those symptoms um, with the ultimate goal of reducing patient burden and distress and ultimately what comes along with that, which can be a dish causes a uh, need for additional care for premature um, institutionalization or having to change um, the environment, the living situation or, or psychiatric hospitalization. So can we prevent um, these additional burdens for the patients, uh, care partners, and families. So with that in mind, um, we think about how we think about managing these symptoms in a, in a very kind of comprehensive manner. And I you know, include this here because this is something that we think about um, as clinicians and managing these symptoms and also that I encourage uh, families uh, and care partners to think about as well, because as you'll see as I go through this, um, this requires a very comprehensive approach. So it requires almost kind of a kind of a detective work and understanding the target symptoms and the environment in which they're arising to best develop kind of a personalized treatment plan for these symptoms. So there's definitely no one cookie cutter approach. And so this integral approach involves an active collaboration of care partners and clinicians to identify the target symptoms uh, for medical evaluation by the clinician with uh, being informed by the, by the individual and care partner and family, including medication toxicity, sources of pain or discomfort, your observations of things for the patient, also providing a history. Is there a history of a comorbid uh, psychiatric diagnosis? Um, how, what we, how might we describe the constellation of symptoms that are occurring in the individual and what, are, what, is, the, what is going on in the environment in terms of interpersonal stress, a boredom or overstimulation, uh, confusing cues, uh, maybe changes in cues that have, that have come up, um, and supporting care partners. Um, because as I mentioned, there's always this, we always think about this bi-directional uh, relationship between what's going on in the environment and what the individual with dementia may be absorbing and reacting to. Um, so it's important that we fully kind of address and understand all of those things. And with this information in mind, always starting with non-pharmacological intervention. So how can we minimize any triggers in the environment or perhaps change the environment um, or better support the, uh, the care partner um, uh, to, um, to alleviate these symptoms, to prevent them from emerging and taking off? And then again, if, uh, in developing individualized treatment plans, simplifying medication regimens uh, when we can. Um, if you know, if we identify target symptoms, you know, treating these in some cases, and um, maybe it, it is necessary, maybe necessary to introduce a medication to target specific symptoms for a time limited uh, period. But always kind of reevaluating 
what is the effect of these combined interventions on the symptoms, um, what needs to change, and kind of going through this process again. So again, there, this being a dynamic process and there being one, no one cookie cutter approach to this. So again, behavioral, I just kind of repeated myself what's coming up in this slide, behavioral interventions always being the first line of treatment. Um, and again, tailored, um, you know, with an eye towards first and foremost, adequate safety and supervision of the individual, of the care partner, and tailoring to the individual's capacity to learn and remember. And so, um, again, um, these are some fundamental principles of how we think about managing these symptoms, but, you know, anyone who's you know, ma you know, clinically manage these symptoms or lived with these symptoms know that it is, this is incredibly complex. So just the, the past few slides that I've mentioned, um, again, it's, it can be incredibly, uh, it takes a great deal of care and time and investment to kind of, to get through this stage and to kind of, um, and, and, and to kind of, uh, to even get to this point and to evaluate what, what is going on and how can, how can we think about behavioral interventions? So what are types of behavioral attention? So again, first and foremost, paying, you know, uh, paying attention to safety, adequate supervision, um, and then thinking about you know, in the realm of behavioral interventions, we tend to think very broadly in terms of, of different forms of therapy or physical activity, different forms which can include med meditation or mindfulness, uh, music, uh, pet or sensory therapy and interventions, um, anything that can provide kind of positive stimuli without overstimulation. Again, this could be tailored to the individual's uh, preferences to he or she is as a person, what they might find most pleasurable, meaningful, and enjoyable. Um, optimizing vision or hearing where possible. Again, that can help with the aspect of environmental change. Um, um, is the environment is the environment changing because the individual has a decreased uh, 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 ability to see visual or or um, auditory acuity, um, and you know optimizing settings to reduce stress and promote well-being is not only the individual with dementia but also the care partner. So thinking about how we can we can support care partners and families as well, and and, and that being a focus of behavioral interventions. So some practical tips that we may think about um, you know, in this realm are to again, identify and minimize triggers, um, to keep in mind when we're thinking about these, these symptoms that the symptoms don't, um, they do not re themselves represent volitional behavior. So they may be superimposed on someone's personality or again, who they are as a person, but they are um, themselves um, driven in large part by brain, changes in brain biology um, that are part of the dementia syndrome. I'm recognizing again this dyadic relationship between the patient and the environment where um, individuals with me absorb emotions. Again, this happens to all of us that we're encountered with. Um, and during kind of uh, inter you know interacting with family members, I feel like remembering it's not always it's not always critical to be right or to reason. Um, sometimes when there's uh, apathy or social withdrawal, kind of nudging or prompting, providing some degree of external motivation if the end result is positive can in some cases be helpful. And the value of routine and predictability and kind of, again, pleasant, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, regular habits, um, activities and pleasant stimulation, sources of stimulation for the individual. And again, an integral part of this is care partner support. and. Um, and through the Dementia Care Collaborative and the programs that are, that are being led by, by Barbara, Susan, and the team, um, this, they've, they've really put together a series of gifted program, you know, uh, wonderful programs to address um, uh, you know, techniques and strategies to support individuals with dementia that care partners and families can adopt, and also to, for care partners to support and take care of themselves. Um, so, so we think. So thinking about this is not only um, kind of providing some overview of you know, you know how do we think about dementia syndromes, um, how do we think about medication choices, safety considerations, aftercare planning, but how do we think about the care you know supporting the care partner and in, in, um, in in preserving their own mental and physical health given the tremendous stress of of being a care a caregiver, and importance of promoting well being. And strategies to promote resilience and well-being for families and care partners. Now, again, this can be a topic in and of itself, and I think there have been related talks on this topic of how can 
um, how can care partners or caregivers, um, you know, uh, take care of themselves and, and what are some aspects of self-care? And so oftentimes we may think about, we may hear about self-care as, oh, this, this might involve getting a massage or doing some other pleasurable activity, but I really think about it as this very basic principle as a fundamental of kind of rest, nourishment and movement as being kind of these fundamental principles of, 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 of promoting uh, brain health and healthier living. So getting, trying to get adequate sleep, trying to get nutritious, um, you know, uh, uh, food choices, connecting with others, um, having some form of movement. So it doesn't really have to be an elaborate um, kind of process, but really thinking about what do I fundamentally need as a, if, I, if I'm undergoing having this stress as a care partner to take care of myself, um, so I'm adequately rested, um, so I can promote my own well-being, preserve my own well-being, um, um, given the, you know, the, uh, given the, given the demands of caregiving. So in the spirit of, you know, thinking about, you know, how can we, um, you know, share this information and provide additional resources for families and for clinicians, um, who are faced with managing behavioral symptoms, um, I, together with some colleagues, including Judy Johansson and members of the um, Massachusetts Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and the Center for Alzheimer's and Research Treatment or CART at the Brigham Hospital, put together through a series of their roadmap series, um, one iteration that included a roadmap to behavioral and psychological symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. And this is um, available on the web at this, at this website. Um, here, just a few excerpts here, this contains contents of principles of family communication, um, troubling behaviors, tips for interaction and communication, tips for helping a loved one with, with bathing or uh, managing an outburst if it does occur, managing wandering, and also kind of additional uh, resources. And these are just some examples here, um, again, about how we might think about communicating uh, with, a, uh, with a loved one uh, with dementia and that it's not always important, it's not essential to be right and really to kind of re provide redirection um, rather than, than butt heads. And so this again can be a very, uh, can be, is a topic in and of itself, but we have some of these resources compiled um, on this site and it contains other links to still other resources that you can um, you know, be directed to um, both just uh, nationally and through uh, um, MGB. We knew that this was just the beginning and we needed to be better, both emotion, better prepared both emotionally and physically. One doctor helped by relating that these incidences uh, to a seizure. When a person has a seizure, they are not acting like their usual selves. Their actions are disease symptoms. This really helped us feel empathy in patients as opposed to aggravation. A care coordinator from the Alzheimer's Association reminded me that while I was doing a great job keeping Steve safe, I needed to remember that my safety was paramount. My safety was paramount. If I ever needed to step away to protect myself, she said that indeed I should. And this is again um, uh, an excerpt from uh, G. Johansson's uh, Understanding Agitation episode on uh, the Bob's Marathon um, uh, site. In addition, we have compiled a roadmap for physicians and clinicians um, as part of the, um, the, the podcast I referred to. Um, and maybe as, as part of your own experience, we may encounter, you know, and through um, certain, not, not all clinicians in every setting um, that we may encounter are necessarily familiar with behavioral and psychological symptoms. So just as, again, we typically think of Alzheimer's disease as, um, as being related to changes in memory thinking and maybe not as, and we aren't as familiar with behavioral and psychological symptoms, um, the same is the same can be true in our healthcare system, and we're working to get as a healthcare system, especially in Massachusetts, to get better at that to provide education to clinicians and emergency room settings and primary care settings about these symptoms and how to safely think about them and managing them. And so, uh, with this in mind, we created this uh, in parallel a handbook for physicians about uh, managing these symptoms, which, which that is also available on the the link that I that I listed. So I mentioned that, um, again, that our first line approach is always behavioral interventions, um, but we also, in some cases, uh, medications um, may be used to, 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 um, to target some of these symptoms. And so this can 
Um, these medication classes, again, are predominantly used off-label, so we don't have, uh, you know, yet a really effective and um, set of, set of uh, medications to target and, uh, and alleviate these symptoms. But some medication classes that are often used for these symptoms include antidepressants, um, including acetalopram, which has been, which has been uh, used not only for mood and anxiety, um, but also has been studied for agitation in Alzheimer's disease as well as stimulant medications, mood stabilizing anticonvulsants, um, cholinesterase inhibitors, memantine, um, are sometimes are used often to prevent or slow cognitive decline, but can also be, uh, sometimes there have been studies of these medications for behavioral symptoms, as well as antipsychotic medications um, are sometimes again used off-label to target um, some of these symptoms. And again, uh, this is always done after a you know, thorough analysis and characterization of the target symptom um, before, and then a discussion of the risks and the benefits and the expected duration of any treatment before initiating a medication. Some novel therapeutic strategies that are being explored in this area and that may have promise in the future include electroconvulsive therapy or ECT. So there's currently a multi-site study um, including McLean Hospital and Emory Hospital for ECT for the treatment of agitation and Alzheimer's disease, as, as well as transcranial magnetic stimulation, other forms of neuromodulation, so non-invasive forms of ways that we can uh, target specific brain regions are being explored for uh, treatment of not only memory symptoms, but also for behavioral symptoms, as well as cannabinoids and dextromethorphine and quinidine uh, are some, but not all of the compounds that are being actively investigated now to see if they can have some efficacy in, again, targeting, uh, preventing these symptoms, uh, slowing their emergence or preventing them from becoming more severe. So I'll just say a few words now about, you know, for example, how we might think about depression as, as this being a very common neuropsychiatric symptom or behavioral symptom in Alzheimer's disease, specifically early in the course of the illness. So depression is um, incredibly prevalent in older adults. Um, um, it, it met major depression and subclinical depression, which can also be very disabling together of a prevalence of 30 to 50%. And depression is common in dementia syndromes. It's not solely determined by awareness of dementia or awareness of someone recognizing that they're having, uh, that they're developing dementia, although that can certainly, the psychological impact of that can certainly play into someone developing dementia, but it's not solely determined by that or by the degree of cognitive impairment. And also how we assess um, depression or mood changes uh, may be related to the patient or the individual's uh, report initially, and then also um, can also be derived from observations of care partners or, um, or family members. So again, late life depressive symptoms are incredibly common. Although there are a number of transitions that we may experience in late life, depression is not a part of normal aging. So we don't expect that with these changes, everyone will develop um, depression. And so um, the neurobiology is incompletely understood. And then we also know that in some individuals that depression um, can actually um, occur very early as a prodrome or risk factor for progressive cognitive impairment or as a prodrome of a dementia syndrome. And I'll talk a little bit about in the last set of slides about what I mean by, by that and how we're um, going forward with investigating depression in that, in that manner. So just briefly, what is depression? So um, it is not only typically the given as sadness, but it is also integrally, integrally, integrally loss of interest accompanied by loss of pleasure. And this can extend to vegetative functions, including sex, appetite, and libido. Major depression includes moderate to severe mood episodes, um, but most um, clinically significant depression is often, again, kind of the subsyndromal depression that wouldn't necessarily meet criteria of major depression, but it can be quite disabling. Um, there may, medication may not be needed to treat depression in late life. Other forms of uh, intervention that have been found to be helpful include exercise, physical activity, adaptive forms of psychotherapy. And some types of depression, again, could be the sub, sub syndromal subtype, a ruminative form, an agitated depression or a psychotic depression where the individual may develop fixed false beliefs in addition to the changes in mood and interest. 
And in dementia syndromes, as we're learning, uh, both kind of in early stages of dementia syndromes and in late and severe, uh, moderate to severe stages of different de dementia syndromes, um, symptoms of depression can look quite different than how we might you know, observe them in a younger or middle-aged individual. So for example, there can be less um, uh, expressions of guilt or suicidal thoughts, fewer complaints of low self-esteem. And instead we may see accompanying the sadness and loss of interest, more rumination, anxiety, and agitation. So in addition to the, uh, the non-medication approaches that we may take to manage uh, depressive symptoms, uh, also pharmacology may be involved uh, first kind of in avoiding drug-drug interactions uh, that could be affecting mood and behavior, and introducing a medication to target mood and uh, anxiety um, either an SSRI, an SNRI, or a different type of antidepressant, we'd want to start at a very low dose and go slow. Um, for some of these medications, we need to keep a close eye on uh, cardiac parameters. Um, we want to also, again, be mindful of some of these medications may carry unwanted side effects on uh, cognition, so we want to be careful in terms of which medication we choose. And again, um, introducing it in a time-limited and a monitored way and assessing the effects um, often and regularly, allowing time for a full therapeutic uh, trial and providing education about what are the expected side effects and what's the expected duration of treatment. So in summary, um, in terms of principles of managing behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, we wanna recognize that distressed behaviors are often clues to an underlying diagnosis or the underlying problem. And we want to conduct a behavioral analysis um, as, a, as, a, as a care team, which include the, the individual, family, um, clinicians involved to determine the etiology of the distressed behaviors. And unless urgent, really take time at this step um, to determine kind of what is the working diagnosis or how we might describe this constellation of symptoms. In every case, we want to use non-pharmacological interventions. Um, we want to consider side effects and tolerability of all medication choices that are implemented. And again, with the ultimate goal of enhancing the quality of life of the patient and the care partner, and ultimately um, slowing clinical progression of the dementia syndrome. So in the final uh, part of the talk here, before we um, uh, go, to, go to any questions, um, I wanted to briefly touch upon where are we going you know, as a field? So I've been told you a little bit, of this, this is the overview of this um, category of symptoms. They're incredibly common and prevalent, where we are in kind of our state of managing them and our approach, the need for more research and for better treatments in this area. So where, is re where are research efforts focused currently? So in telling you a little bit about um, these research efforts, I, I, I would be remiss without um, talking, saying a little bit about biomarkers and how these have really helped us as a field um, to advance research and, and hopefully we'll continue to do so in the future in the treatment and prevention of dementia and these behavioral symptoms. So if we think about biomarkers and we think about this as any accurate and reliable measure that may indicate the presence of a disease, a disease pathology and that, that can be useful to help us detect a disease. Um, be useful for differential diagnosis, so for differentiating between something that we may be suspecting as Alzheimer's disease or another type of dementia syndrome. And it can be important, biomarkers can be important not only in clinical research studies as we understand biology, but also increasingly in clinical practice in making uh, diagnoses of certain uh, types of dementia syndrome or whether something is dementia or is, or is Alzheimer's disease or a type of dementia or whether it's related to a reversible cause of cognitive change. So uh, with kind of the advent of biomarkers or with uh, in, you know, uh, more and more biomarkers that are being validated, that are being developed almost every day, um, uh, this field is changing. And so some of the um, areas of research focus are on diagnostic criteria and characterization. So how do we define, um, for example, psychosis? How do we define apathy in a dementia syndrome? How do we define depression? So I just mentioned that um, how these, you know, these, these presentations in a dementia syndrome can look different or oftentimes do look very different from how we might observe them in an adolescent or a middle-aged individual or someone who doesn't have dementia. And then how do we go about with, with those, uh, you know, with that criteria in, in mind, how do we think about assessing these symptoms? 
Um, how do we think about, do we, you know, what, are, what instruments that we, do we use? What questions do we ask of, of patients and their care partners? Are there biomarkers that can help us predict who might develop, who might be more prone to develop depression or anxiety or psychosis? So that's, again, an a, a active area of research. And again, um, what is the neurobiology? Is it the same, uh, are the same changes in the brain that are giving rise to, to memory and thinking problems also giving rise to mood and behavior problems are there, or are there different mechanisms at play? And also the, all this leading to, if we intervene to develop, if we do in fact develop, um, develop treatment uh, for, these, uh, for these symptoms, can these be treatment targets to actually slow the progression of dementia or prevent, or, or prevent dementia? So these are all very active areas um, of research that are undergoing just that, that are that are uh, underway um, through um, a working group of, of Alzheimer's Association, which is kind of an international working group that collaborate um, actively in this area. And as a matter of fact, I was just on a call with this group um, in the hour before this. So, so a little bit about um, biomarkers. So. Um, one of the ways that we can visualize brain changes or one form of biomarker can be a PET repositron emission tomography neuroimaging. So this allows us in a, um, in a living individual, as you can see in the top panel, to visualize where in the brain amyloid protein is located and how much amyloid protein is there. And also in the bottom panel, using a different uh, probe for tau protein, also through a neuroimaging scan, we can measure and assess where is tau protein located and how much is there. So these are example images of three individuals, um, it, one who was 75 with no memory problems, one with subtle memory problems, and one who met criteria for Alzheimer's disease, probable Alzheimer's disease dementia. And so these biomarkers can provide some value into, um, again, um, predicting who might be more likely to progress or helping to make a diagnosis of the dementia syndrome. And increasingly, as I mentioned, this is a rapidly changing field, we're able to measure um, some of the molecules, for example, that may define Alzheimer's disease, just amyloid and forms of tau protein through plasma samples, um, which could, um, in the future, as these assays are developed and validated, could really be a game changer if through blood draws, we might be able to predict who might be at most risk of declining and at what rate, or who might be able to, or who might be most uh, likely to develop a certain constellation of behavioral symptoms. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, I know in previous um, talks uh, in this forum, we've you know we've, we've touched upon it's been touched upon stages of Alzheimer's disease, and biomarkers really have allowed us in the in in this field to understand that there is a preclinical stage thinking of this as a very early stage of a dementia syndrome where, where an individual may have very subtle changes in memory and thinking. So it doesn't meet criteria for dementia, but is noticing some change or a family member is noticing some change. And on investigation of biomarkers, they do have evidence of elevated brain amyloid in the case of Alzheimer's disease. This may progress to the stage of myocognitive impairment to Alzheimer's disease dementia. So, the advent of the ability to measure biomarkers in living individuals has helped uh, to understand Alzheimer's disease and related dementia syndrome that's progressing through a series of stages. So as these brain-based changes occurring, sometimes decades before someone might uh, get to the stage where he or she is rapidly forgetting and that's becoming very obvious to the patient and, and family. So again, pre, we uh, now know through measurement, these different curves represent kind of the trajectories of biomarkers that we can measure either through CSF or brain imaging. And so we can see at the stage of, again, MCI and dementia, these are the kind of clinical stages of the disease, but we can see these biomarker curves are actually picking up and even plateauing quite, quite early. So years before someone might re reach the stage of MCI or myocognitive impairment or dementia. So the question, again, an active area of research, uh, kind of in my work and in others, is how do depression and other neuropsychiatric symptoms relate to biomarkers and prevention efforts? So where do they, where do these symptoms fall along this curve of biomarkers? Do they relate to amyloid or tau or other um, early processes or brain-based changes that are occurring?
And so again, uh, we think of like as Alzheimer's disease beginning in the brain decades before cognitive symptoms and as mild cognitive impairment being a syndrome that precedes dementia. And could there be a neuropsychiatric sy symptom syndrome that might afford an opportunity to prevent um, dementia? And so this has led to the development of um, a concept or kind of a theory of mild behavioral impairment. And so really this is getting at symptoms of, you know, we think about usual aging is accompanied by some changes in memory and thinking that often aren't problematic and don't affect uh, our independence and in tasks. Um, in some cases, these uh, changes may progress to mild cognitive impairment or dementia. But similarly, brain-based changes may give rise to behavioral symptoms, which have been thought of that can also be a precursor to dementia and have been uh, thought about as a stage of mild behavioral impairment that represent a change for individual's baseline. So again, we think about um, these biological changes in the brain occurring these changes in memory and thinking that may or may not progress. And in parallel, we think about behavioral changes that may progress. And of course, this is an oversimplification and we now know that there are lines kind of going back and forth between behavioral changes and cognition. Um, that again, memory and thinking changes can affect um, someone's uh, mood and anxiety and then vice versa. So it's a very complex picture. <clears throat> So the implications for this uh, area of research are identifying, uh, you know, can we identify at very early stages, um, identify a set of symptoms that might, that might mark underlying disease pathology and could this provide a window of opportunity for intervention? Or, who, or identify in the case of depressive symptoms who might have the highest risk of decline and might be the best candidates for intervention and ultimately to develop more effective prevention and treatment measures for depression and cognitive decline. So in the last few slides here, I'll just mention some of our, uh, the key areas of our research program that we've tried to focus on. Understanding is depression and late life actually associated with Alzheimer's disease pathology. So with, with amyloid and tau proteins and other measures of neurodegeneration. And um, specifically, what are this, you know, what's the relationship between brain pathology, memory and thinking changes and mood and behavior? And are there, finally, are there a particular set of symptoms um, a particular set of mood and anxiety symptoms that are, that are most closely associated with Alzheimer's disease pathology and risk for subsequent decline. So we've been uh, carrying out uh, the large majority of uh, these research efforts in a uh, observational study that's based here at MGH that many of you may have heard, be familiar with, the Harvard Aging Brain Study. And so this is a community-based uh, study of individuals that's entering its ninth, now 10th year Individuals, individuals age 65 to 90, and they undergo annual clinical assessments and also uh, brain imaging. Um, uh, when they enter, they, um, uh, they do not meet criteria for cognitive impairment or dementia. Um, they're for the most part healthy without serious medical illness or stroke or without serious um, previous psychiatric illness. Um, they're excluded if they have moderate to severe depression, um, but if they have mild depression, they um, are permitted to enter the study and some individuals, as we follow them, may develop um, more severe depressive symptoms or cognitive changes. And so just to get to the punchline of like, what have we found in this study? So we found that basically in the right that actually increased depressive symptoms in this sample, even in a very subclinical range, were associated with increased tau protein. And we also found that increased depressive symptoms coupled with brain amyloid shown in these scans here were together associated with worse memory performance. And why this was interesting to us and why this is kind of a, uh, we wanna pursue this further is that, we, that these uh, relationships, we all, we observe these and older individuals who actually don't meet criteria for dementia, who are for the most part cognitively normal um, may or may not have concerns about, you know, subtle memory changes. And so even in these, uh, even in this very early, kind of for the most part healthy population, we see this relationship between uh, depressive symptoms and brain uh, pathology. So it's something we're definitely actively exploring uh, further. We've also found a similar relationship between tau protein. So seen in green here, 
being greater than red, being greater than blue. So more tau protein is associated with more depressive symptoms. And also this can uh, this this differs whether or not someone had a history of early life depression or whether this was new onset depression or not. And I'll just skip over this. I'll just briefly touch on, we, we mapped in the brain, where do we see these changes between uh, tau protein and depressive symptoms? And we, again, find that we've seen them in, in, these, in these medial, uh, the hippocampus, which is central to memory and thinking and also to mood regulation. So that's where we see uh, pathology, the brain pathology driving this relationship. So in summary, through our research uh, uh, in this area, we found that depression, amyloid, and cognition are closely related over time, and that tau protein and other forms of neurodegeneration are independently associated with depression over time. And all of these things are of interest to us because they support depressive symptoms as potential targets um, in, try in, uh, in prevention efforts and ways that we might think about preventing Alzheimer's disease. However, the data that I showed you so far has been uh, carried out across a low range of depressive symptoms and a, and a highly educated community sample. And so with a relatively uh, you know, low degree of medical burden. So we're, we're trying to um, uh, investigate this relationship in more diverse samples um, uh, that are more representative of the population. And also we are investigating them in individuals who actually have history of depression actually have severe, um, more moderate to severe depressive symptoms. And we're doing this through a pilot study, the mood and memory and aging study or moment study. We've actually recruited individuals based on having a diagnosis of depression when they enter the study. And we hope that through these efforts, through the studies that I've shown you, through our ongoing research efforts in this area, through the moment study and other um, avenues, what is the ultimate goal here? Uh, as, as, oh, and this is a, sorry. This is a relate. This is this is some early data from the moment study that we again see similar relationships between um, increased depression and increased tau protein um, and decreased volume of the hippocampus. And our ultimate goal here is to understand the brain biology, not for its own right, but for using this to inform how we can intervene. Uh, um, to better manage these, uh, these symptoms. So ultimately we wanna combine uh, this uh, direction of research with informing intervention studies, which can target different uh, mechanisms, including physical activity, uh, diet, social interaction, so social interaction and sleep hygiene. So that's the ultimate goal here where we'd like to go with, with this body of research and how this can best um, you know, uh, kind of help patients and families. Can we prevent dementia? That is our ultimate goal with um, carrying out research in this area at the end of the day. So this is a uh, picture also again of me and my Nana Rose. And this was um, actually when I was just finishing high school, going off to college. And um, um, and this was, you know, this was kind of towards the end of her, of her, uh, of her journey with Parkinson's disease, dementia, which she ultimately, has to come to. And just through my own family's experience, uh, again, this is a, not only a professional mission, but there's a lot of personal um, uh, drive in this as well, in terms of having experienced the psychological, physical, financial um, uh, consequences or, or, um, or manifestations of, of this illness. And so, um, this is ultimately, we want the research to lead to, 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 to going back to helping patients and family members um, so they can have better outcomes than our, than our family did or have different outcomes. And again, we're trying to do this through phenotyping, through using these uh, uh, research to find prevention efforts and so ultimately using this to support patients and families. So in closing, I would like to thank all of you for listening to through all of this and also thank the, uh, my research colleagues in the Harvard Aging Brain Study, The Moment, the Multicultural Alzheimer's Prevention Program here at MGH, the research uh, participants, their families, their colleagues um, for uh, making this work possible and the support of our research efforts, clinical research efforts in this area. And again, thank you all so much for um, for attending and, um, uh, and for all that you are doing um, in your own uh, journey in this in, in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gentle. And we'll now um, 
uh, close the slides down. And if anyone, I already have about six questions. Feel free to enter any questions or comments, and I'll review them and, and certainly read uh, them out loud. Um, first, I want to say Nana Rose would be really proud of you. Look how far you've come. Uh, I mean, and we're so fortunate because, um, and this is why the, the, the depth of your lecture was so great. And in fact, many people I know want to review it and view the, uh, the recording because you as one wonderful clinician researcher, you, you combine your, your research of our brain which we can't see, but you're studying the clinical manifestation and treatment of behavioral symptoms. And as I know, as we know in our program, you speak so well and so passionately about caregivers and their needs and their support. So you embody it all. And uh, that's why there was so much to process tonight. Um, I, I'm going to start with a few questions and comments. Um, one thing, uh, Dr. Gatchel, that comes to my mind, you know, in, in, as you describe uh, the symptoms, both of dementia and its subtypes, and then, of course, behavioral syndromes and such, it is all observational. Um, uh, to the caregiver, um, essentially. If, I, if one has a stroke and is paralyzed, we see that. We can go to the physical therapist and we see that paralyzed arm. Or if there's a pain in my shoulder, I can define it. What is so stunning and complicated, and this is what I think we all talk about, our worry for our devoted and exhausted caregivers is they, as you said, are the detectives. They're watching, they're observing. Uh, if there was a loud noise outside, maybe that's why there's a startle effect. So there is just this ongoing 24 seven process of wondering. Could you just speak to that, you know, in a general way, acknowledging what I know that we've talked about. It's hard, it's hard, it's exhausting. And there's no perfect science to the observation. Right. No, absolutely. Yeah. And I think you touched upon a really, you know, key point there that it can be, it's very complex because of the interplay of the environment, um, one's own, one's own observations, kind of what the, what the individual with, with MCI or dementia, what they might, what the patient might be reporting or expressing. So it's very complex. And then, as you mentioned, it's superimposed on, um, just kind of personal, you know, it was just, exhaustion or, or kind of, or kind of the stress of kind of being in his 24 seven or, or all encompassing role as a care partner, a caregiver. So, um, and so again, so that's, um, you know, so it is, um, so I guess, you know, I mentioned that the, that the, uh, the care partner and family partnering with the clinician to, you know, to, you know, to um, describe what they're observing or what they're experiencing, um, but also don't want to, you know, put the tremendous onus that, you know, you have to write everything down or capture everything exactly as it's happening. Uh, but really just to, you know, take a step, just to kind of recognize, I, I want to emphasize that point that your observations and what you're feeling and experiencing are, are, are incredibly valuable uh, to, to the clinicians uh, who, are, who, are, who, are, who you're working with. Um, in, in these areas. And we can, we want to hear not only, you know, we don't need to hear like a meticulous report of, you know, at 8.07, we heard a no noise outside and this happened, but, but just even any kind of general observations that you might notice and also like how you're feeling and how you're processing. I mean, that's part of, that's part of what helps us understand kind of what's going on kind of in a secondhand way. So, um, so, so not feeling that that's an additional, not taking that on necessarily like an additional burden that you have to capture everything, but also, but just kind of recognizing that what you're, observing and feeling and experiencing those 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 things themselves can provide clues to kind of what might be happening or how to best manage the situation or intervene if it's necessary. Thank you. A couple of things that I think people have heard about. Could you define sundowning? Perhaps people uh, have heard about that or they've experienced it. Yeah, so sundowning um, is a term that is often used for um, 
kind of an observation that may occur in terms of uh, there being some kind of diurnal uh, variation in, in both memory and thinking changes and also behavioral symptoms. So you're most kind of thinking about like a fluctuation in kind of sharpness of memory and thinking. So literally as the sun goes down or kind of an area in time in hours that are later in the day around five or 6 p.m. roughly, or in kind of that late afternoon or early evening period, many people observe or experience with dementia may experience worsening of memory and thinking. And this is also accompanied sometimes by emergence. You know, if these psychological symptoms, behavioral symptoms and psychological symptoms are present, these may also kind of emerge and sometimes peak at that time period. So that's oftentimes what's, what people might refer to, like my loved one is experiencing sundowning or you hear about sundowning and it really is just kind of describing that oftentimes for reasons that we don't completely understand, uh, there seems to kind of be this kind of fluctuation in these symptoms where they may sometimes have an emergence and peak kind of in that, um, in that time period during the day. Thank you. And one follow-up to that, um, you, uh, can you define a delirium? Because you mentioned there are many types of dementia, mm -hmm. which is the umbrella term. Yeah. Is a delirium a type of dementia? Yeah, so a delirium, that's a good question. And so a delirium is kind of a different, uh, kind of, uh, fundamentally it's, it's a distinct brain state that, um, so deliriums we think about because of an acute change in brain uh, function, which is characterized by um, um, fluctuations in consciousness. Um, it's often caused by, it can often cause, be caused by reversible causes. Um, and so it, it by, by kind of identifying, so the treatment for delirium is kind of identifying what are the, and are the, uh, the triggers and trying to eliminate or minimize those. And it's often not a progressive uh, brain change as we may think about in the dementia syndromes. It's often something that's kind of short-lived um, that can often be reversible. <coughs> There's different brain processes. And it's characterized by kind of this fluctuation in consciousness and awareness. Um, so it is not uh, a subtype of dementia, but what's complicated is that it can often be superimposed. So someone with a dementia syndrome can develop kind of, if they develop an infection or another perturbation in kind of their medical status, they can develop a delirium that's superimposed on a dementia. And that can sometimes make the dementia syndrome, meant dementia symptoms worse. Um, but so these are kind of distinct uh, processes um, at play. And then some dementia syndromes such as dementia with Lewy bodies are actually also characterized by um, behaviors, kind of fluctuations in consciousness um, that may resemble a delirium. So what I've learned from you and, and, uh, and other physicians is that uh, with rare exceptions, one's dementia progresses somewhat on a steady course. But if there's a rapid or dramatic change, that's time to call the doctor because there may be an infection or a problem which may be causing a delirium. Is that right? That's, that's right. Yeah, that's right. There can be there can be very you know anything ranging from an infection to an environment environmental right. change can give rise to delirium. And then that leads to a question. My mom is on med multiple medications, and I'm observing side effects that she can't articulate them herself. So it's stressful. Uh, any any comment you want to make to someone? who knows that her mother's on so many medicines and not sure if they're contributing to more confusion or not. No, absolutely, yeah, that's a really important, um, you know, it's a really important question because it is common in, um, as, as we kind of advance in age and both related to dementia syndromes and, and not, that medications can accumulate over the years, right? So something we may be served on in midlife may just, may just continue to be prescribed and we continue to take it. And then oftentimes, more often than not, our medical problems are increasing as we're, as we're older, as we're getting older, so more medications may be added over time. And um, this is combined also with, just in terms of our healthcare structure, that we don't often sometimes have some a central person who's kind of driving the ship, who's kind of looking at all the medications together as they're being as they're being prescribed, and kind of looking specifically for the potential of interactions. So, what I would suggest in this case, and again, that's not a fault of any one 
physician or, or treatment team member, but, but oftentimes we have these kind of silos of care, which we're working through kind of different programs at MGH and different healthcare systems to get better at kind of the care that we can provide individuals to minimize this effect. But one thing I would, uh, you might suggest in that case is to kind of identify a physician on the treatment team who really can serve the person, can serve the role as a point person. So this might be a primary care physician, if not that person, if there's a behavioral neurologist, a, a, a primary care physician who specializes in geriatric medicine, a geriatric psychiatrist, all of us kind of love to play these roles and to kind of try to minimize uh, medication. So not only, so we like to, it kind of makes us somewhat, I don't want to say delighted, but we like to kind of trim a medication list to kind of ask what, you know, what are we taking? Why is this there? Do we need it? Sometimes it is needed. So I would never stop a medication without consulting, you know, with having a detailed uh, consultation because stopping medications can also cause side effects. That's why you want to do it in collaboration, you know, with the physician. But I would, you know, kind of identify who could play the role of this point person to take a big picture look of all the medications, why are they on board, which ones can be trimmed, what are the risks and benefits of each. Thank you. Uh, what kind of food is best for people with dementia? Yes, that's a, I saw that question in the chat, and that's a really interesting um, question. So there are, you know, there's a lot of information out there on different diets, and can some can diets can what we eat like prevent dementia? So I would say that really the strongest um, body of you know evidence, um, you know, there's a lot out there that in small study, maybe in one or two studies, may show some promise. But I think the largest body of evidence supports um, a Mediterranean style diet. Um, and also a heart healthy diet. And so these diets would be defined by um, just what we think about individuals in the Mediterranean uh, enjoying or kind of taking part in, including green leafy vegetables, olive oils, focusing on uh, fish, kind of plant-based proteins, minimizing red meat, mi minimizing processed food. All of these things you may think about as kind of striking a chord is also that they're sometimes promoted in what we might think about as an anti-inflammatory diet which is also kind of closely aligned with the Mediterranean diet. Um, and so, um, so I think there's the most, there's the strongest body of evidence for that type of a diet um, as being protective for mood and overall um, brain health. Um, so not that it can necessarily like reverse a dementia, but that it can, this is also, this is often what I recommend to patients uh, who might have early stages of cognitive changes or or even um, depression and anxiety that, that this type of diet um, is, is worth a try and can, can be very healthy. It can be very help, can can be helpful at um, you know, optimizing uh, memory and thinking functioning and mood functioning, as well as we know that you know um, optimizing uh, uh, blood pressure control, um, which can be done not only through uh, medications but also lifestyle approaches, which can include diet. So kind of a heart healthy diet in conjunction, you know, with um, with kind of a with a uh, physician who can kind of direct you of what might be, how can you introduce a heart healthy diet to manage uh, to manage cardiovascular risk, and that can also uh, protect uh, brain health. Great. Uh, before we get into a few research questions, I'm going to read a short paragraph. Uh, someone whose spouse has a diagnosis of young onset Alzheimer's and has been hallucinating. Uh, with an imaginary friend for the past nine months or so. Um, he talks happily to the friend uh, for much of the day. And in fact, he thinks he's working on a novel with the friend. Um, this woman hasn't intervened or said the friend is imaginary because in fact, her husband who's otherwise impaired is content. Um, do you think his behavior needs more intervention? Uh, sometimes, even when we're on a walk or with other people, he'll suddenly start to talk to the friend. She does say that her doctor, his doctor, has provided her with some medication should the hallucination ever become, he ever becomes agitated. But the, I think it's a really important question, one that I've heard you and others speak about. Um, we appreciate that he is ill, though if he's ill and in a comfortable state, can you speak to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And what was your last um, uh, statement there, Barbara? Your yeah. well, it, it, you know, uh, she. Well, the question is hallucinations. We know 
are a serious symptom of a serious illness, though you don't always, as I've learned from you, eliminate, speak of eliminating them with strong medication. Right, right. Um, and yes. this, this is her question. Yeah, no, right. That's, and I think that's a really important question and kind of gets back to like, what are our overall goals for, um, you know, uh, thinking about these symptoms and managing them. And so kind of thinking about alleviating uh, stress, distress of the patient and the care partner and the family, optimizing safety, um, pr improving quality of life and kind of sense of sense of purpose for, for, for the individual. So again, so although I don't know the full, you know, I, I can't make a full, uh, an actual clinical assessment without, you know, um, knowing the full clinical history. And it sounds like there is a clinician involved who's really thoughtfully provided some medication options should these um, symptoms get more severe or distressing um, or something changes acutely. But I'd say, I mean, generally, yeah, I agree, Barbara, that with what you, that's correct with uh, our approach is, approach is generally like if these are not distressing symptoms, and in this case, maybe actually providing, you know, so, increasing quality of life, increasing kind of purpose or the individuals kind of deriving um, some sense of relief from this experience that we wouldn't necessarily think about eliminating these experiences. If there was an acute change or something changed, again, it sounds like the, uh, you are prepared with the as needed medication or kind of steps that you might take if something did acutely change to become distressing. Otherwise, I agreed would not want to eliminate something that overall is promoting kind of a, a better, it sounds like an improved quality of life, improved sense of well-being. Sure. Thank you, and and I think we could all appreciate this. This how fortunate this gentleman is that his spouse, that you are so sensitive to his well-being, appreciating that it's difficult for you to see, but you're content to see that he's content, and that's often a big part of the experience. Dr. Gatchel, you spoke so much about the important research that you and others are doing. So, how does one participate? Uh, in a research study. Yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking, I just also, just something came to mind about the last question I wanted to touch upon there. Sure. As you were mentioning that, Barbara, is that, um, right, and just kind of, as you, as you spoke to kind of speaking to the, the thoughtfulness of the, of the care partner um, in recognizing that this is a, this is providing a sense of wellness for the, you know, for um, her spouse, at the same time, you know, recognizing that this could also be, this can be distressing to observe, like for the care partner. So although mm -hmm. it may be promoting wellness, it could, it can sometimes be, sometimes be distressing to kind of recognize someone's hallucinating or that this is a, it can be uncomfortable to observe. So kind of also honoring that aspect of the experience and kind of thinking about, you know, would it be helpful? Can I talk to someone to get some support around this? Like recognizing this may be good, positive, my loved one, but it's really hard for me to see. Um, so also kind of recognizing that experience too. I just wanted to just that. Yeah. Thank and, you. Yeah. And then um, and then I think you mentioned that how do you get involved? How might you get involved in research? These right. Research. Yeah. And that's a great question. And so um, we can provide there's there are um, a tremendous kind of amount of uh, you know research opportunities, uh, not only for I'm gonna you know, behavioral symptoms, but for prevention, uh, dementia, different stages. Um, here at MGH, the Brigham, McLean, other institutions in Boston, um, we can provide some up, some uh, with the with the link to the roadmap. We can also provide a link uh, to how individual kind of just kind of a first starting point um, of through kind of a collaborative uh, network between MGH and the Brigham, uh, where you can kind of initially kind of as a point of contact to kind of think about all of the, the, the big picture, a uh, number of research studies that are that are underway. That can be just kind of an initial uh, point of contact for getting involved. Okay, and Dr. Gatchel, a number of people have asked for the link to the roadmap. Yeah, let uh, me try to pull that up here. Could you, I, maybe you can, and one other person asked it for, there's a close up of the sleep hygiene slide. Mm -hmm. I think that will be, I don't know if, if there's so much a close-up as when the person views the uh, video of this program, you'll see it. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I don't know if there'll be. Um, I'm trying to pull up the trying to the roadmap. Okay. Let me try to put that pull up here, and then 
for that slide, I can either go back to sharing it if you wanted to okay. take a look, look at it. If that. you can do that, we're going to be finished at seven, folks. Okay. So we have five more minutes. And uh, okay, Judy. Yep. And so we'll finish with the sleep slide and the um, roadmap. Okay. It might be hard to. I'm realizing that may be hard. Ah, the sleep hygiene. Yeah. yeah. So that may be something that, let's see, I can send a larger version of that image. And then we could send it out. Yeah, uh, that sounds great. Or even I can add that. To, or we could put it on our website yeah. or we'll, we'll figure yeah. something out. Okay. <laughs> that's good. Let me just see if I can get in the last few minutes. To get and, and by the way, while she's looking for her slide, sleep hygiene is as important for caregivers, maybe even more important. Or at least as important as a person with dementia. Fair to say? Yep. Okay. Um, are you looking for your slide now? Or well, I was just looking for the roadmap link. Okay. Yeah. Well, Dr. Gatchel, oh, uh, you know what? Um, Nori said if you can send her the link, we'll send it out. Uh, no problem. So we can assure you all you'll get the link to the roadmap and you'll get an enlarged sleep hygiene uh, slide. Um, and someone likes my quilt. I didn't make it, but I like it too. Thank you. Um, I want to take uh, any last one minute question. Ah, you see www.madrc.org. That is the, who can, who can speak the acronym? Uh, that's the research department, yes? Yes. Thank yes, you. Massachusetts um, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, and that contains kind of also a link of how to getting involved in research, and it contains the roadmaps within that site or the roadmap links. Fantastic. So on that note, again, to remind you all, in about 10 days, you'll be able to review and share with others uh, tonight's talk because it is so deep with wonderful, important information. Dr. Gatchel, again, I, I, I'm, on behalf of us all, it's wonderful to have you as a physician, clinician, researcher at Mass General. You help countless people. And I know I feel so honored to have you as a, as a mentor and a colleague. So I thank you for a wonderful, wonderful talk. And to all of you, uh, so yeah, we do, we, and to all of you, Thank you for participating. After this program, you'll receive, but you can do it, you'll receive an evaluation, which it helps us to understand your impressions, your, your wishes, uh, what will help you in the future. And please take a minute to, to fill that out. Um, I also wanna to mention to you that, uh, remembering that this seminar is always on the third Tuesday of every month. So if you're someone who likes to block your calendar in a recurring way, third Tuesday, no other plans, okay? Um, September 21st is our next program. And it's very exciting. Uh, Dr. Suzanne Coven, who is a Mass General Physician and here, and she's also a writer in residence. You may know her, Dr. Gatchel. Many of us have had the pleasure. Um, she's going to be the topic that she's going to be speaking about is writing as a catalyst for reducing stress. Gotta, gotta do it, gotta do it. So thank you to my colleagues. Thank you all really. Be well, be safe. And we're so happy uh, that our community is growing. And thank you for joining us. Good night. Good night.